Then you start to realize, wow, really if I'm opening my heart up to this ultimate experience, what I really want is, and what I really need to experience is true humbleness. The humbleness of starting to begin to first see that I don't know. Not that I don't know in a partial way, but I, I have to start to come into an experience of humbleness to see that I really don't know anything about anything. Talk about a, a pride washer, you know. It's the ego doesn't like the idea that it has no contribution to make to the truth. Not even a partial contribution or a slight contribution. That's that's insulting to the ego. But but actually to not know, you know, to come to that state of, of not knowing is is what's so important, absolutely important in opening to the ultimate experience. The I don't know mind is the, is the highest state of mind. <laughs> it's, that's higher than yes or no. <laughs> I don't know. And that really is essential to coming to that ultimate experience because anything that you have as a preconception of what you think you already know ends up being a block to true knowing. That's why it has been said that to hold an opinion is to to not know who you are and to not know who God is, because opinions don't have anything to do with truth or reality. It's kind of a great practice when you think about it, like, oh, today let me go through the day without one single opinion. Mm -hmm. You know, try that out. <laughs> and that's good, you can go through and go, hmm, where is my mind at? Am I focused on these opinions? So I wanted to talk a little bit about guidance because guidance is, you might say, the spirit reaching you where you believe you're at, and that's absolutely practical and essential. And I would say that the rules for decision in A Course in Miracles, near the back of the text, come to mind, where Jesus says, your one remaining problem is that you first decide what to do and then ask. See how simple it is? I mean, it's really, we're getting down to crunch time that late in the course. You first decide what to do and then ask. It's just a bad habit. You know, it's a habit of a mind that believes it's a human being, of a mind that believes it's a doer. You should call it a human doing instead of a human being because there's such a focus on doing. What am I going to do today? What do I do next? What are you going to do? Well, I don't know. If what you're going to do jives with what I'm going to do, and you know, all of the difficulties that, that come. Even when you think about the concepts of human relationships, you know, I've pondered that at times. It's like, it's, it's interesting that, that the words in and out are used in, in relation to relationship. Are you in a relationship? Are you out of a relationship? When did you get in? When did it start? When did it stop? You know, it's, it's kind of denying that there's this constant thing that we're always dealing with this relationship issue and trying to put it on the timeline and make a big deal about when it began, when it ends. It seems like there's a number of difficulties and emotions associated with the in and the out. Uh, with the beginning and the end, and also in the middle. It's just, it's a tough concept. It's a tough concept to deal with, you know. Are you in one? Are you out? I don't know. It's just tough. It's just a tough experience. And so, this habit of deciding first and then asking has to be reversed for there to be peace of mind. We have to come into a get into the good habit of, of asking. Like the Course is really, the workbook's taking us in that direction. What would you have me do? Where would you have me go? What would you have me say and to whom? Beautiful. It's, it's taking us into a direction of starting to be open to be guided, to ask. 
And then in terms of relationships, wow, that is so important to, to really link up and join on decisions. It so undoes the sense of independence and of autonomy. We learn from A Course in Miracles, Jesus says, your autonomy is the autonomy of creation. You are given creative ability by your source and that's your autonomy. It doesn't have anything to do with ego autonomy, which is personal autonomy. And it seems like in this world there's like this attempt to find a balance between independence and autonomy, individual autonomy and dependence. Um, being dependent on another person, being dependent on society or the world or Mother Earth or something, like finding the balance. But, but really true autonomy is autonomy of creation, of being as the mind was created by God in, in spirit. So, to join and to link up on decisions just rubs the ego the wrong way. The ego, the ego really doesn't want to have anything to do with guidance, unless it's its guidance, you being a slave to it. The ego likes that. It wants, you, it wants the mind to be dependent on it for everything. And therefore it has generated a time-space world a whole cosmos of false cause-effect relationships, at one point Jesus calls them spurious cause-effect relationships, and the ego is very set and very single-minded that the mind will remain a slave to those spurious cause-effect relationships. Whether it involves medicine or things, do's and don'ts in relationships or morality, or uh, things that involve the environment, weather conditions, it doesn't really matter. The ego is just content as long as the mind remains a slave to spurious false associations, to spurious cause-effect relationships, because it doesn't want you to realize that mind is causative and that there is nothing outside of mind. Once you realize that mind is causative and there is nothing but mind, there's nothing outside of mind, the game is over for the ego. You've effectively ended this tyranny of false rulership and you accept the strength and power exactly as it is in mind and as mind. So the ego is always trying to perpetuate a sense of external causes and external effects and that's what has to be washed clean. So, to bring it home a little bit in terms of practicality, uh, I know I went through a lot of cleansing and clearing, a lot of tears for many years, a lot of praying, discernment lessons, asking, asking. Sometimes I would just ask and ask and ask and, and I would have this gentle wisdom inside me. It would say, it's good that you are starting to ask me for guidance, it's very good, but don't become obsessive. There's no need to ask for every decision during the day. You know. Should I take my shoe off? Should I go out the door? Should I do? No, don't become obsessive with it. Just, just trust in me. Start to have a feel of opening up to the guidance of the Spirit and trust that you're going to do just great, that I've got it. The Spirit's saying, I will direct you. Just be willing to come in my direction and you'll see that it's going to get easier and easier for you. It'll, it'll be more like a flow when you start to align your mind. But don't become obsessive about it. Don't try to become obsessive with every single specific decision. That, that just reinforces the specific differences when you just get obsessive about it. It's interesting that you could even yeah, become too obsessive about, about mind training and decisions and you need to relax and ease your way into this. So, one of the things that I work with in Messengers over the years is we, we link up, it takes a while to learn all the terminology, we link up, we join, <laughs> we connect, uh, you know, we basically do this with a lot of decisions and, and it's amazing now that it's, it's become more habitual so that when there's a decision to be made, it's like, it's a humble feeling of just linking up over these decisions and joining on them. 
and it's a great habit because when you are linking up to join in decision making, you are open to asking. You're not saying, I already know, I don't need to, to join with you, I don't need to link up, I don't need to listen to anything, I don't need to hear anything. It's flipping things around to really seeing the importance of joining and connecting and linking up. And then after a while it becomes such a, a good habit and it becomes, we could say, internalized to the point that you become so humble and just kind of just eased into this position of listening and inner listening and inner listening and flowing and following and following that all of a sudden you say, oh this is natural. It's just, wow, this is what Jesus must have meant by today I will make no decisions by myself. This is what, oh, this is what he meant for. Holy Spirit, decide for God, for me. Don't you like the ring of that? Holy Spirit, decide for God, for me. It's like really saying, you, be you in charge. You know the way. You know the way out of, of the dream of, of separation. You know the way out of perceived hell. And my life is not my own. In the Bible it said, it is not I that live, but Christ that lives in me. You see there's a shift coming from this autonomous, separate sense of a will apart, to a merging in, a yielding into this glorious flow that has been our natural state and always is our natural state. Uh, it's, it's absolutely delightful to move into a day with, with an open mind that is not, doesn't have a to-do list, isn't set on outcomes. Just being wide open to let the day be almost like a paint, like a blank canvas that can be painted with all these beautiful splashing colors. How free, how wonderful. Ooh, what's going to happen today? What, ooh, like, ooh, a splash of green, ooh, some red and yellow. And you can sit there and behold the painting as it's right before you and really be in the glory of it without trying to control the painting, without, you know, without trying to be the artist even. Just be more the witness self, be the observer and observe it. Um, there was a man, some of you have heard of, Abraham Maslow, uh, who was a beautiful psychologist, humanistic psychologist, and really kind of the, one of the, like the, the leaders in that way of thinking in psychology, along with Carl Rogers and Virginia Satir and a number of beautiful people, but it was, he discovered self-actualizing people are those in which they see no distinction between means and end. So, in a sense, there's not the artist, the human being who's performing or painting or dancing, which still breaks it down into the linear timeline, it's just an experience of flow, of extension, in which everything merges together. There's no difference between means and end. You're not doing something for the future. You're fully present in whatever it is. It's like you merge, you are the art. You are the art in motion. And yet, we're not talking about the motion of a human being, we're talking about just the motion of the presence of spirit uh, athletes talk about this when they're in the zone. It's the same thing. There's not a thought of score, there's not a thought of winning and losing, it's just like everything can seem to even be in slow motion. It's so spectacular and glorious. And there's a merging going on there. So, very much we do encourage guidance and, and really it seems like that's the pathway to this ultimate experience is which you join, you connect, you, you come without preconceptions, you come without outcomes, but you come with a willingness to be shown, to let it be given, to receive that which is given. And that's what carries you higher and higher and higher and higher to this ultimate experience. As you are lifted up towards this ultimate experience, you become more and more and more clueless. You become very clueless. You know, and more, even more clueless. And, you know, ultimately that's what salvation is. I do not know the thing I am, what I'm doing, where I'm going, how to look upon this, or myself, or the world. It's, you, you, 
you graduate when you become completely clueless. That's the, that shows you how important the emptiness is, how important the not knowing is. And again, I'll come back to that point of trust. You can't really enter in that ascension of going into the higher and higher realms of consciousness without trust in the spirit. Uh, that's what makes it all possible. As long as you are trusting on past learning and we'll say the linear construct, uh, that just means that there's a fear of the vertical or a fear of the higher realms, a fear of love, and that will mean you will stay arrested in consciousness at, to the extent that you want to hold on to past learnings. So, you know, you may go through a lot of experiences and you, you may go through some and you say, oh, that's, I, I like this and I don't like this. I've got my likes and my dislikes. And then you say, I want, would like more of my likes and less of my dislikes. And then you go a little further and then you think, uh, you start to feel like, wow, my mind is powerful and I can, I can draw forth more of what I like and less of what I don't like. And then you go a little higher and you start to realize that, yes, your mind is very powerful. And then it starts to get real humbling where you start to realize, I thought I liked that and I thought I didn't like that, but I, I really don't know what I want. You know, you start to get into this spinning thing of, what do I want? <laughs> if my mind's powerful, I think, you know, you know, like the song, you can't get what you want till you know what you want. And if you don't know what you want, it can, you can draw forth a lot of conflicting witnesses and conflicting experiences. And then you start to empty out even more and more. And now you're, you're pretty sure you're right on, okay, I'm on the right path now. I've, I've got, I'm in the tractor beam. Things are going good. And then you still have some things that, that you, are pretty sure that you want, but then you have some experiences and you go, what's happening? How, how did that happen? I, I can't possibly have wanted that. No, it's not, that's not what I wanted. And you know, then it goes back and forth, but still, there's still unconscious uh, filters, there's still unconscious beliefs that are still bringing forth conflicting witnesses. So, we all know that it's a purification that that in the end, we are purified and purified and purified to the point that that our wanting is purified. That uh, finally, in the end, our, our prayer is, you know, let thine eye be single. You know, or you could say, I want the peace of God. That's, that's where this is going. It's like a vortex of energy taking you into, I want the peace of God. I like the special effects. <laughs> Always seems to happen in canyons too. You know, what is something about these canyons? So, so that's really the context for our talk and discussion today. Because you had a good glimpse with the movie last night, and now, again, spirituality must be practical. We try to bring it home to make it as practical as possible, because you can relate to what is practical and you can't really make decisions beyond which you can comprehend anyway so it comes down to really opening up to that guidance to let the spirit go before you and and lead you in those decisions of your life you're making decisions to unwind from the egoic thought system and the only way that you authentically unwind is to decide with God, or to decide with the Spirit as you move forward. And that's beautiful, that's very, very practical. That, that becomes almost like the song of your heart. Today I will make no decisions by myself. You know, I will be led. I, oh, I want to be led. <laughs> I'm just ready to be led. And then, as you get into the joy of that mode, you know, it becomes obvious like, wow, this is truly the way because there's such a lightness and, and happiness with it. <laughs>